So um, hello, everyone. My name is Karen. If you've been in the main room, you've probably seen me up on stage there. Um, I am a program manager here at Google on the team. I've been here for, on this team for 15 years. Um, so some folks that have you know, been using Google Earth and Google Earth Engine for a long time, I may have known you for a long time. If not, I'm excited to get to know you. Um, my background before Google was in GIS and remote sensing. Um, for my, my various studies. Um, I um, learned Esri or ArcView 3.2 back in the 90s, and then um, as Esri went through their whole transition into ArcMap and ArcGIS, learned some of those tools. Um, I taught myself Erdas Imagine in grad school. Yeah, right? Um, and uh, just reading the manual, um, if you guys know Trimble, GPS stuff, uh, eCognition, Definians, like a um, little bit of Envy, uh, the reason I name all these things is because, like, um, I never learned how to code the whole time because a lot of these tools are really powerful without knowing um, how to code. Um, but they're not necessarily um, uh, uh, APIs or application programming interfaces like Earth Engine is. And so oftentimes, you know, you're, what you're doing is you're kind of doing a, an analytical process on your desktop and not necessarily able to build an application and deploy it on the web and leverage the Google Cloud, or le leverage any cloud for that matter. So that's one of the powers of Google Earth Engine is that you're able to do analyses at scale, take advantage of cloud computing, and we'll talk about what that means a little bit today, show you what that means a little bit today. Um, but, but that's why it's helpful to have a course like this, just to get you guys a little bit used to seeing code and modifying code. Um, one thing I like to say is that most coders are not people who write code from scratch. I didn't know this till I came to work for Google. They are coders just like me who take somebody else's code or a previous code that was written by their predecessor and they modify it and update it and they change it to what they need. They pull a little code from here, a little bit of code from here, they run and it sometimes doesn't work. And then they change some stuff and debug and then it works. Right? So I just want to give you that little pep talk because that might happen to you today, right? And, and Val's here and Steve's here, others are here too, and I'm here to help you guys through that. Um, and the goal for this is to leave with like, oh, I get what Earth Engine is. I understand um, that I can use it. I can get my hands dirty with it, but I know where to go now for my next steps, okay? That's the goal today. Um, I'm gonna go to this slide here to put this up again, the signup.earthengine.google.com. And I, there might be some issues with signing up. So Val's here to kind of help you guys walk through it. Please um, raise your hand if you're not able to get online. Or not, online, yes, if you're not able to get online. If you're not able to, um, to get on Google Earth Engine. It's about five minutes or maybe eight minutes before you, we're going to start actually touching the code. So you have a little bit of time. OK? Fantastic. I should also say that we really want to hear your questions in the recording for those folks that are watching on demand later. And so Steve is here with a microphone, and he's going to be the runner, right, to come and give you a microphone so that we can hear your question. It's OK if you start talking before. Just make sure that you can repeat your question once um, Steve gets to, to you with a microphone. OK, great. All right, so our agenda together today is to talk to you guys about what or describe what is Google Earth Engine. Um, I'm going to do a very quick introduction to remote sensing. Um, this is, you know, remote sensing is, is a whole, like, college course or at least a weekend course, you know. I mean, it's, it's a lot. So this is the, the bare minimum that helps you know what you're looking at when you're looking at a satellite imagery. Um, this might be a repeat for a lot of you guys who, who have done um, satellite imagery work before, but it's, it's a good reminder for us all. Um, then I'm going to talk about the different components of Earth Engine. You've probably heard Michael and I talk about up, up in the stage, like code editor, JavaScript code editor versus, or together with Python, Colab, like there's different pieces of Earth Engine that I'll talk to you about and, and kind of show you how to plug into them. Then we'll get familiar with Earth Engine together. And of course, most important is where do you go next for resources to learn more? Okay, so what is Google Earth Engine? And I like to also have another title is like, what makes it special? Um, what makes it special is that it combines three very important pieces together at one, one location. It combines data already there for you. You don't have to go find your data. Sometimes you do, but there's already a lot of data there for you. 
a uh, lot of satellite imagery catalogs, a lot of different vector data, demographic data, and more there for you to do analysis in a data catalog that's sitting there and growing every single day. When a satellite flies overhead and sends a picture to NASA, for example, Google is moments away getting it from NASA catalog and ingesting it into ours. What's more, we're also doing specific processing on it so that you don't have to do that on your own dime. We're doing that for you. And you know, you don't, because sometimes pre-processing can take hours or days of your, of your life. We can do some of that pre-processing for you so you can jump into your analysis. So all that data catalog just there ready to be used. We'll explore some. Number two is the computational platform. And this is where the words that we're gonna write or copy and paste today come into it, right? Whether it's classify or whether it's buffer, these are just basically the computations that you're gonna run on the data. Um, and this is you know, what the engineering teams are constantly working on, improving, adding on to it, um, different functionality, right? And then finally, which we think is one of the most important pieces of the Earth Engine ecosystem is all of you guys and all of the scientists, what like 90,000 plus scientists that use Earth Engine on a regular basis. Scientists are every walk of life. All of you guys are scientists in this room. Um, maybe, you're, maybe you don't have a degree in data science or maybe you're not a remote sensing specialist, but you're still scientists because you're gonna be inquiring on data and asking questions, right? And that is science, that is using um, so, uh, data for science and inquiry. So we're totally infatuated with this uh, community. Uh, this is why we do this, um, this summit every year um, and why we have a lot of channels for you guys to ask questions, not just of the Googlers, but also of other community members. So it's, it's a huge, that's a huge um, advantage, I think, um, to Earth Engine when what makes it special. So what does that mean for you guys? It means you can take data like pixels that are in the satellite imagery and start turning it into knowledge or insights, right? That you guys might have a question, to answer a question you might have. So you might have data that you've collected in the field or data that a satellite has collected um, and it might be already in the catalog or maybe you add it to your own private catalog. Um, and so whether that data is tabular, sometimes also known as vector data, which is like points, lines, polygons that have data and rows and columns behind it that represent information about those points, lines, and polygons. That's tabular data or vector data. It might be that kind of data. Or it might be raster is the term for imagery data or gridded data, right? And so those are two of the main groups of data, uh, vector and raster data. And so when you collect data, that might be going to the catalog and getting it, or that might be you actually going and building it yourself. Um, that's kind of the first step. The second step is to compute and analyze it with the functionality. And there's lots of different things you can do in Google Earth Engine. We're gonna to touch the surface today, but we are gonna do a little machine learning and a little classification. Um, the bare bones of it, the stuff that's kind of baked in. But the sky's the limit. You can design your own machine learning algorithms and so much more um, as you guys become more expert. And then finally, you can visualize. You can um, add colors and shades and hues and opacity, you know, transparency, all sorts of different things, graphs, things like that. Um, and what's more is that there's a lot of examples of how to do that in Earth, Earth Engine and in the docs. So you'll be able to like find those and copy that paste over, copy and paste the code and make it work for your code. Um, okay, with that introduction to Earth Engine, next I'm gonna go into what uh, a little tiny intro to remote sensing. Um, remote sensing is basically looking, sensing something remotely, right? It could be um, a air, from a camera on an airplane, or it could be a camera on a satellite. It could be special sensors that may not be referred to as cameras like LIDAR and other kinds of radar and stuff. Those are all remote sensing things, right? Um, if you look at satellites and the cameras that are on airplanes, oftentimes those collect data across a very wide area of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we may remember from you know, classes in school that the electromagnetic spectrum is very long. It goes from gamma all the way to x-ray. But each of these parts means something. Um, and specific parts can be leveraged for understanding environmental and other types of things on the planet. 
If you look here in the middle, you'll see the visible area. This is what we see. This is what our human eyes are able to understand. If I go outside and I look at a tree, I am only seeing this little tiny part between 390 and 790. This little tiny part of the huge spectrum because that's all our human eyes are able to see. And so, and that's, that's key because we need to be able to see the remote sensing data. We need to be able to see, you know, what, you know, the tree or whatnot. But there is a huge swath on either side of the visible part that our eyes are able to see that we can't see. We can't even begin to see if we wanted to, but we have cameras that have been designed to see them. And what's really cool about that is that there are these different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum that give us certain superpowers depending on what you want to understand. So for example, starting with just the visible, if you're in an airplane and you look down, you are literally seeing visible imagery, but it's the real world, visible imagery, and you're looking at it in the RGB. This is, this is basically the visible imagery. And I like this image because it looks like a huge snow, like if you were flying over the California Sierra Nevada mountains in the winter, this is what you see. And that's exactly what it is. It's covered with snow. And you're looking down. You know, there may be some clouds there, but clouds and snow are both white. And you're looking down and you see this. This is what you see. But if you start to look at this same exact image in a, with looking at it and using different parts of the spectrum, you actually can start seeing other things. Like if you start bringing in the near infrared, which happens to reflect plant and vegetation and biomass that sits in leaves and stuff and trees, then you're going to be able to see different things that our naked eye can't see. And so this is showing that, oh, there is actually is vegetation. It's showing you where that vegetation is. And it's showing you on the other side here, this white area, that's snow. If you go further and you look at green and middle infrared, then you start seeing more thermal or moisture. And you start seeing where is the snow versus clouds. And where is the snow... Um, uh, where are there lakes? So if you see there on the right, upper right there, those are lakes that may have been really hard to see in the visible with our naked eye, but, and, the, and the snow, really hard to discern between clouds and snow. But these different bands can be utilized to pull things out. Okay. I want to say that we only have about four or five more slides. And so if you guys want to get, and I know it's after lunch, and I'm not, I'm not calling anybody out because I've been yawning all day too. So if you guys need to stand up, I encourage you to stand up because in about a couple of minutes, we're going to sit down and actually use it and then it'll be like super fun. But this is, really, I think, really helpful. This helped me understand Earth Engine and remote sensing back in the day. So if you look at an image, like this is an area in um, Rondonia, Brazil, in the state of Rondonia. It's in Rondonia, Brazil. And it's... Um, a huge area, and my little laptop cannot process this image at all, okay? I can't process this because this is a huge area. If I wanted to process the whole Amazon, I definitely couldn't do that, or the whole globe, I definitely couldn't do that. So how can Google Earth Engine help me? What's really cool about Google Earth Engine is that it takes an image without you even doing a thing. It takes an image and divides it up into a ton of little sub-regions and then separates it across all these different computers in the data center this used to be incredible, and people used to be like, oh my god, that's amazing. But now, of course, this is cloud computing. Everybody knows it, right? But this is exactly what happens. You take, if you want to do a classification across the whole globe or the whole Amazon, for example, or just this image, it will basically chop it up and process it in parallel, and then it will do your, your classification, do your algorithm, and then bring it back together and mosaic it without you even knowing. And that's what's beautiful about this is because you're able to just scale up. Pretty cool. Okay, so that's like the basics of Google Earth Engine. Now we're going to start getting into how you guys interact with it, how you surface with it. Now you've maybe heard Michael talk about um, the JavaScript code editor and the Python collabs. Those are the two ways people surface or, or, or get to Earth Engine. The first one is a JavaScript code editor. Some people call it an IDE, um, a interactive development environment, I think where you basically get to change the code, hit run. That didn't work, change the code, hit run. That didn't work, and interact constantly with it. That is accessible through code.earthengine.google.com. 
Um, it's also, you can link to it from the homepage of Google Earth Engine. And this allows you to perform analyses, investigate data sets, manage all your scripts and your data as well, and then build interactive tools as well. We're going to use this today when we get hands-on. There's also a Python notebook. So if you guys are Python users and if you come from the Esri world, you may have done some ArcPy and some Python and feel comfortable with that. So I encourage you to do more with Python. There's a lot of amazing introductory lessons on, online, which I'll show you before you leave here today, where you, which you can introduce yourself. But a lot of people use both. And some, one of the reasons they use both is because the JavaScript editor allows people to do that interactive, try something, hit run, try something, hit run and prototype things, and then when they got their algorithm down, then they'll start deploying it on Python. And the reason they like that is because then they can integrate like a lot of other things and build applications that drives their applications online and things like that. They can, integra they can integrate with other things that exist in the Python world, which I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about because I don't, but Val can tell you about it. <laughs> so. The colab.google.com is where you would start, but all of this is li listed out in the, in the Earth Engine developer documentation, so I, I can help you either personally help you or we can go through at the end of the class too if you're interested in kind of getting started there. Uh, okay. There's also, once, you've, once you as the Earth Engine user, you've used Code Editor or you've used the Python notebooks, then it's, you're like, how do I share this out? How do I share this data with other people? One really great way is something called Earth Engine apps, which are built with the Code Editor which allow you to build a window into your data and analysis so without, and, and, give them, and give people in the world access to your work without having to log into Earth Engine. And this is really useful if you, want, if you want to show before and after a fire or a flood or tree growth or whatnot, and you just want people to be able to interact or build a slider to go back and forth between two time dimensions whatnot, you can build a simple app and then just share it with people, and then they can, they can look at that and view that. So it's a great way to share your work with other people. And I'm sure if you guys attended the anatomy of a published paper, they talked about these. Like, yes, if you build your data, and you publish your data, and you publish your, your research, it'd be great, it's a great idea to build an app so people can explore what you did and, and see that result. So it's a great way, it's a simple way, a relatively simple way to build those external apps. Okay. So this says go to code at code, but don't go to there yet unless you want to. You're welcome to, but you can go to there. And you'll see this. If you want to go there, you can, but I'm just going to walk us through. This is the code editor. We're about to start the hands-on session. So I want you guys to get familiar with all the buttons and the locations. And this is a, um, an image that is online, and I'll show you later where it is. But it walks you through the different aspects of the code editor. So what you'll find here is um, at the bottom of the map or the bottom of the screen, you'll find that's where the map, that's where your results are, that's where the data that you bring in, you'll see your data. Um, there's, there's this little thing um, right here that I'm showing with my mouse that shows, uh, it says layers, and this is where you manage your layers. This is actually where you can turn on and off or change the transparency of some of your layers so that you can like, see different results uh, more easily. Um, and then at the top, you have three windows. On the left-hand side is where you manage all of your different code snippets, the things that you're writing. You might um, be, that's where you upload data, like your assets, data assets, um, and you can share those data assets with other Earth Engine users, et cetera. Um, and then you can also find a lot of scripts examples, and we're gonna go over this together, but a lot of stuff is here. This is kind of your library of tooling. And then in the middle here, this is where you write the code, or like I said at the beginning, where you copy and paste your code in, okay? And then modify it and click run. Yeah. Yeah, you need to have some code and then, yeah, sorry, yes, good question. Morgan's question was, she didn't see the layer manager when she went there for the first time, so that's because she hasn't like added any data or hasn't clicked run on her future project to then see the results. So we'll get there, yeah, perfect. And then, and then, so this is where you put your code. And I'll go into these when we start actually using it. But, and then on the right-hand side, this is where a lot of results come or a lot of visualizations. There's some, like non-map results is the best way I think about it. Um, you, there's something called an inspector where you can click on the map once you have data there. And then you can actually see what's the data behind the data, things like that. So we'll go through that. Um, and then you can track your, 
your tools, I mean, sorry, your tasks and things like that. So that's great. And then at the very top is a search bar. And that's where you can search for data, search for locations, like a place on earth where you want to do analysis, things like that. Okay. I'm going to start now. We're going to start the hands-on session. So I want to pause and ask, are there any questions? I'm sure there are, but if anybody is brave enough to ask them now, I can answer them. Okay. Okay. Well, Yes. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I might have missed it, but did you say do does and I'm I hope I'm wording this right. Do Python and Code Editor talk to each other? They do talk to each other in a way that you can have your Python code, I mean your 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 JavaScript code, and there are ways to click a button and start transferring that JavaScript code into the Python into Python language. They're not necessarily meant to interact with each other. They're just basically two surface areas for you to either write JavaScript or Python, but they do interact in that way where you can migrate from one to the other. Um, mostly I've seen people who build and prototype on JavaScript and then deploy on Python, but, but I've also seen people who do both on Python and both on JavaScript. I should say mostly I've probably seen people stick to one, but a lot of people do do both. Yeah. I don't know. There's other people in the room that probably have different experiences. Like maybe Val. Feel free to speak up if you have anything. All right. Cool. All right. We're going to get started now. Let's go to this website. And wait, before you do, I should say that... Um, if you don't have access to the slides yet, you should go get them because we're going to do a lot of copying and pasting. So I'm going to go to the website, which hopefully you guys have all visited. If not, just Google Geo for Good 2023. Um, and you'll come to the agenda page here. And as we scroll down, we'll see um, Earth Engine for non-coders. And you see how there's a, it says presentation slide under resources. Click on that, view resource, and that will bring up the slide deck that I have been presenting. And I'm currently on slide 12. And I see a lot of anonymous users, which is great. That means it's all of you guys looking at it. So one of you is a, a bat, one of you is an armadillo. Okay. So the reason I want to show you this is later we're going to start copying and pasting, and the code is in these slides. And so, you know, this is going to be simple and we're going to, you know, slowly get more complicated, but I want to start easy. Okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to click on this developer.google.com slash earth engine data sets link, and it will go to this website. And basically, you know, this is a little bit of time. This is about a minute or so where you guys can just explore. And I want you to explore. I want you to like look down here and see, okay, there's climate and weather, there's atmospheric, there's weather, okay, there's imagery, there's Landsat and Sentinel. Landsat is a joint program of USGS and NASA. There's Landsat 7, 8, 9, maybe even before 7. Um, Sentinel is the European Space Agency's Copernicus, Copernicus program. There's Sentinel 1, 2, 3. There's lots of different Sentinels. Um, Sentinel 2 is very popular. Um, there's MODIS data, which is daily. Um, but it's coarse, there's high resolution. This is not for the whole, the whole globe. This is NAEP imagery, um, you know, for the US. Other, there are, there's a lot of aerial imagery in there, but it's not for the whole globe. There's lots of other data sets like land cover, terrain, agriculture, cropland, geophysical data. So you can scroll that way and that'll kind of help you find. But if you go to the top, there's a view all data sets and my personal favorite browse by tags. And, you know, it just allows you to search for something like, I don't know, air quality. Or I started typing air. There we go. And then I click air quality, and it shows a bunch of Sentinel 5P data around aerosols, um, ozone, and more. 
And so this is a great way to just look around and see what, what's, what's there. Another one is demographic. Nope, that didn't work. So how about population? Oh, this is data sets that are tagged. Oops, I'm going to go back now. There we go. Demographic. And then there's four. World pop data, land scan data. So all of this is here for you to just bring in. And what's nice is that you don't have to fight with different projections. If you guys had done GIS before and data's in different projections, like everything's there ready to just be overlaid. Okay. Um, feel free to keep searching around. I'm going to move forward just to like get you guys excited about getting some data into Earth Engine, but I encourage you because we're going to, I think we're going to finish a little early or take some breaks and you'll be able to go back here and pull in more data for the, for the site that you're working on. I'm going to go to the Landsat, one at the top here. And these are all the Landsat satellite collections. Um, there's lots of different ones. And I think that, you know, I'm so glad that Val is here. Raise your hand, Val. Because <laughs> she's an expert on all of these, um, and, or a lot of them. And so she'll be able to tell you kind of the differences. And we're going to be using Landsat 8 in our exercise today, which is, you know, Landsat 9 is the newest. But Landsat 8 has been around for several years now. has a lot of good data in it. So we're going to use Landsat 8. I'm going to type, I'm going to literally click on Landsat 8. 2013 to present. I'm going to scroll down. There's a lot to choose from here on this page, too. There's surface re reflectance. This is basically what is reflected off the surface across all these different bands of the le electromagnetic spectrum. There's top of atmosphere, which is basically saying, I want to know what's reflected off of the entire atmosphere and the Earth. Like, I'm basically understanding what's on top. And sometimes that's important to do atmospheric analyses, right, if you're trying to understand what's in the atmosphere. Um, and then there's raw data. This is basically the raw data that NASA publishes before a lot of these other um, kind of corrections or analyses, pre-analyses are done. We're going to do surface analysis over here, and I'm going to click on Tier 1. Okay. I'm going to go back to my slide deck here just to show you that all of this is outlined here in the slide deck. So if you ever want to repeat this at home or teach it to your kids, you know, or colleagues, whoever, um, you can go through it with them. So we clicked on Landsat 8 and then Surface Reflectance Tier 1. And that brings us to this page here. So there's a lot to find out about this in this page. The provider, this is the data set availability, what date to what date. You can see that the most updated image was from September 29th, okay? Um, some data is here more recent. Some data it may be delayed for some reason or another. Um, that's a good place to find it because this is automatically updated when we get new data in. And then we have this Earth Engine snippet. We're going to see this. We're gonna, not going to copy and paste this because we're going to automatically bring it in. But this is a helpful um, little snippet because you know that this is what the Earth Engine labels, this is the name that Earth Engine sees for this image collection. Um, and then if I scroll down, there's a great description. It links to additional documentation and more on the NASA and USGS pages. If I go into bands, remember I told you earlier that there's like the visible bands, R, G, and B, but then there's all these other ones on either side of R and B. And so this is all the bands in the Landsat 8 image. What you'll notice is that Band two, oops, sorry, sorry. Band two, three, and four are the visible area. And I know this because it says band two is blue, band three is green, and band four is red. But there's band one, which is ultra blue and some coastal aerosols. There's band five, which is near infrared. Band six and seven are short ray, wave infrared. And each of these, again, can be combined to tell us something different. And then if you scroll all the way down, you see something that says Explore with Earth Engine. And today we're going to click Open in Code Editor. Once you, you know, start exploring Python collabs, this code over here is helpful to copy and paste into your, into your collab. But we're going to be doing this one. And we're just going to down at the bottom here under JavaScript, just so we know in case you guys are exploring. Under Code Editor JavaScript, I'm going to click Open in Code Editor. And this will bring you into will open a new code editor window, and it will bring the code into it. And now I can click Run, which is the button right here at the top middle. 
and I see a result. And now we have a layers, a layers panel here that I can turn on and off. Okay, yes? What's the difference between a tier one and tier two data set? Tier one and tier two, good question. I have an answer for you. So tier one is data that meets geometric and radiometric quality requirements. It's according to NASA and USGS, right? And tier two is data that doesn't. <laughs> Please, yes, always. So tier one is- is your, sure is your thing on? Are we on? There we go. Yeah, so tier one data means that they've gotten it per correctly georeferenced and ortho-rectified. If you took all of the pixels in a tier one image and stacked it with a bunch of other images from Landsat, we expect they would line up so well and be perfect for analysis. Tier two data we collected, but sometimes you say, you know, it might have like part of an island in an image and there's clouds over it and we're not quite sure it's quite to that same quality standard. So they don't just get rid of those images, they put them in this lower tier and you'll find a lot of coastal areas, islands, um, the, uh, Holes, you end up with more images in tier two. So if you're finding a lot of missing images for one of those areas, you might check tier two. You've got to be a little more careful because it's not the same quality standard. But for most things, you're going to want to go with the tier one data because that is just the best that we had. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Val. Um, okay, so you guys are looking at this screen now, or should be looking at this screen now, and there's three points I want to call out. The first one at the very top allows you to filter the dates. And so right now, it has it filtered to the month of May in 2021. And then what it's doing is it's kind of combining them into a composite. So you're really getting a good picture of what May looked like in 2021. But if you want to see what May looked like in 2023, all you got to do is change the year 2023 0501 to 2023-0601. So it's really easy to change dates, filter, filter dates. Second um, are the band combinations. You can change these bands. Right now, we're looking at the true color, what we would see from an airplane. But if we changed these, we would be able to then see what the satellite sees that our eyes are not able to see. But it's going to put them into three bands so that our eyes can actually make sense of it, right? We're not actually seeing other bands. We're just seeing them represented um, in, our, in the colors that our, our brain and eyes can see on the screen. I'll show you that in a second. And then finally, if you want to do analysis on a particular area here in this class or whenever, a good way to do it is to change the latitude and longitude of the map center because it right now is, I think, centered somewhere in the middle of, of Nevada, um, the state of Nevada. Okay, so we're gonna do that now, where I'm gonna first find um, 2023. This is gonna be May of 2023. So I just changed the dates up there. I'm, I'm also going to comment out. You'll notice there's a comment up here. It's called, a, it's a, basically a green line, a green text, and it starts with two forward slashes. That basically, uh, Earth Engine ignores anything there, and so it helps with like, you can document and comment it out. So if I click slash slash, then I'm basically commenting out map center, and it just keeps it wherever it was when I clicked run, okay? So if you zoom way out, that might be a lot of data, it might take forever. If you zoom way in, it'll be fast. Um, but if I zoom over here, let's say to the Bay Area, or ever, whatever you wanna do your analysis, right? Um, and I click run, it'll stay in this area. Um, the last thing, well, let me click that now and click run. This is now finding data from this May for this location. Now, I mentioned the bands here, and right now it's showing true color. If I want to show, let me go here. If I want to show other bands, so these are all the different Landsat bands um, in order. And if I want to show different bands, like show something different on the a screen or have something pop out, then I would change my band combination. So true color or natural color is band four, three, and two. What that means is that's showing the red band in the red spot, the green band in the green spot, and the blue band in the blue spot. But I can change it so that um, it's actually showing the blue and the red, the green and the blue, and then near and for red in the red. Okay, that didn't make sense, apologies. But it basically move, it shifts the bands and shows them in a different way so that you can see different things. For example, 
I'm going to choose this one here, color infrared. Um, I actually copied the, the, the code on the next slide, 20, uh, slide 22. I'm gonna copy this code and I'm going to go into my script again and I'm going to just copy this whole thing here. Oh, that's a different one, I'm sorry. That's showing a different one, let me go down here. Well, that's, that's okay, this is a different um, composite. So I'm gonna copy that code, click Run, and now it's showing um, a, a false color which pulls out water. You can see there the, 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 um, the bay and the lakes really pull out. It also pulls out um, recently flooded and burned areas. Um, because it it's basically very hot or very wet areas. Um, at the moment, this isn't a great example, except of course the reservoirs that really pop out. Another a good band combination would be, um, so that's basically what you see in this area. If you, if you have a recently burned area, it, it will pop out like that in a, in a purple color. Um, another really popular band combination is color infrared or um, uh, yeah, false color infrared. And that is basically this one here, band three, band four, band five. Notice I'm going backwards because this is like RGB. Um, oh no, this is RGB, sorry. Band four, band, band five, band four, band three. So I'm gonna copy that and put it in my bands here and click run. And now I'm able to see the image of the area, the area in color infrared, which is showing the redder is the more vegetated or the more biomass. So if you ever see images like this, which are a very popular way to look at environmental or vegetation um, satellite imagery, you're able to see this is much more greener area than say this, which is a little more urban, than say this, which probably doesn't have a lot of trees, or much more um, impervious cement and whatnot. This green, that's a great question. So this green, if I unclick my layer and I go to the satellite imagery just to look for some, um, for some ground truth here, I'm, I'm able to look at you know, satellite imagery to see what it is. I could also go back to true color. But this is basically salt ponds in the San Francisco Bay where they're specifically kept at certain inundation and salinity levels to help um, with birds, bird habitat. They used to be salt ponds where, where salt was grown and now they've been restored and they're specifically designed to keep certain flyover areas for birds migrating, whereas some other ones like this one here and this one here have been completely let back to uh, regular um, vegetation. So yeah, so they're reflecting differently than say the, wa the bay water or the, the vegetation. Okay. Back to my slide here. So I'm gonna stay in a non-present mode, but I'm gonna kind of um, uh, keep moving and I'm gonna show us how we can build in Earth Engine a classification. So this is, this is now we're, we've, we've, we've sat up, we're, on, we're in the pool, we sat on the stairs, we've gotten our feet wet, you know, maybe we've gotten a little bit in the shallow end and now we're gonna start swimming toward the deep end a little bit, not all the way, we won't get there in this class, but I wanna get you guys used to how we use it and, and getting some code in there. So we're gonna build a classification. We're gonna build this in Earth Engine, what this is. Well, this is showing different points that I've trained the, uh, the algorithm to say are urban, vegetation, water, and we're gonna train it and build a classified map. Um, and if you wanna see the finished product, you can click there, but you don't have to. You can look later if you want, but that's basically what we're gonna build at the end of this. All right. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna get some input data. And by the way, I'm not presenting on purpose, so you guys can follow along and we're gonna be copying and pasting the code. So the first thing I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna go back into my um, Google Earth Engine code here, and I'm going to go up here and click Clear Script. I've just, or I, I can click Reset, or I can also click on that little drop down and click Clear, clear Script. And the reason for that, I just kinda of wanna start fresh. Okay, it's a nice way to start fresh. If I had wanted to save that, which is not easy to, it's easy to recreate it, you can click save and it'll save it over here in the scripts that you own. As you can see, I've done in the past, I've done, um, I built something for today, and then also um, an NO2 data for California fires. I showed that one time. So those are the two things that I own and if you click save on any of your code, which you will later, it'll show up here. 
for you for you to use later. Okay, so going back to my slides, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find some input data, and we're going to use some really beautiful cloud masked data. This is different. This is pre Val's work in Cloud Score Plus, but it's a great way to get um, uh, beautifully clear data. So what I'm going to do is um, here in the Earth Engine Code Editor. Uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to point, I'm just going to look here and trust you can see my little um, cursor. Under um, scripts here on the left-hand side, you can see that at the bottom there's something called examples. There are so many different scripts here that you can look through, and we'll look a little bit later. But if you go down and um, click on cloud masking, you'll see a couple of different data sets that are already cloud masked, meaning the clouds have been removed in the image. And so I'm going to choose... Cloud, uh, Landsat 8 surface reflectance, and I clicked on that, and all of a sudden, poof, code was added to my window. Okay? If you didn't clear your script, it might have asked you, do you want to save your other script? And you can either say no or yes and save it and do this over, but the point is, it, it, it just fills in this, this little window here, and I'm going to click run. Now, it moved me over to Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, and if I scroll down, I can see why. That's because here, under map on line 32 of my little editor here, it says map set center. So just because I don't want it to pop back to Spain every time, I love Spain, but we're gonna do an, an exercise over in this area of the, uh, this neck of the woods. If you guys wanna do Spain or any other place on the planet, feel free. It's the same tutorial, so you're good. But I'm basically gonna go back, search for San Francisco and come back to this area. But the data is still the same. The data is still here. It's still cloud masked, beautiful Landsat 8. And some of the same stuff is here as was before, where you can filter the date. This is currently um, one year from January 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2021. So if you want to change that, you can change that. We're going to be classifying data for 2020. Yeah, 2020. So if you want to classify data from 2022, do that. And why would you want to change the date? Well, if you're trying to understand fire scars on the landscape, or if you're trying to understand the flood ex extent of something that you know happened in 2022, you'll want to change the date, right? You won't see it in 2020 data, obviously. I'm just making sure you guys know that that's how you would go and zero in on the area, the timeline of the, time, of the things you want to capture. Okay, and then you can see here, sure enough, it has the bands added, and right now it's showing it in true color. So that's why I'm seeing exactly you know, what I'm seeing. So what we're gonna do first is we're gonna start adding training points. And what we want to do is we want to build a, a map of water, urban, vegetation, bear is another one. We're gonna add four classes, all right? And we're gonna do that in order together. If you notice here, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. To this, to this area so I can see what I'm looking at. And if you'll notice, here on um, the upper, upper left of the um, window, you'll see here this little um, point line polygon bar. And we're going to be adding some points to train our classification. So I'm going to click Add Marker. And then I can start adding markers. The first one I'm going to um, add are urban points. And I'm going to draw or, or po uh, add points here, because that looks like an urban location. That looks like an urban location. Now sometimes, and it's always encouraged, you build your ground data by going out to the field, looking at what it is, taking a GPS point. That's, that's real ground truth, because you're there in the field. But for this exercise, and, and if, you don't, if you don't have access to the field, sometimes you can see what it is, and you can, you know, build a classification manually or training data manually, but it's always encouraged to go out and do it um, in the field. So I've done about, let's see, about six or seven urban points. Right now it's just called geometry. So if I go under my geometry inputs, these are, that, that's where this has been stored, seven points. So I'm gonna click on this little gear because I wanna give it a name. I wanna give it a name that's, that's called urban. So I click on edit layered properties and it brings up this little configuration window. I'm going to change geometry to urban. And I'm going to change import as 
feature collection. And the reason for that is because I want this to be stored in a collection of features or vectors, like points, and I want that to be able to be called in my code. So I'm gonna base, and collection is basically many. It's not just one, it's many different feature collections together or features together. So I'm gonna call this a feature collection because there's seven of them. And then I'm going to add a property. I'm gonna basically call this land cover. And the reason for that is because later my code is going to call it land cover. It's gonna say, okay, train my land cover. And so I basically am gonna call the property land cover. Now, this is interesting here because I need to give it a value and this works best if you give it a number and each of our four classes are gonna be given a number. Um, and what's interesting about coding, and just take my word for it, it's not easy to understand, so sometimes the numbers start at zero, okay? You guys may have heard of arrays or other things like that. A lot of times number lists start at zero and then they go zero. So we're gonna go zero, one, two, three. So the first class is urban. We're gonna call it urban. This is the name of it, but its property land cover is zero. Okay, it doesn't mean there's zero urban. It just means it's just kind of the, the code for this class. And then I click okay. I'm gonna repeat that three more times, okay? So bear with me here, we're gonna do this again. And I'm gonna do, build some three different ones. So keep watching if you want to see that again, and then you'll be able to build it here. If I click new layer, I'm going to, this one's gonna be water. I'm gonna do some water layers. I'm gonna zoom out so I get some ocean too. Some ocean. I'm basically taking samples. This, these samples are going to train my model. I'm gonna look for a reservoir just for fun. Here's one. Click in there. I want to get different representations of water, so I might choose to choose. I might choose this area here, which is wetland. It's inundated water, even though there's vegetation inside the water. I might get one area that's more murkier than others. Okay, great. I have a lot of vegetation points, or sorry, water points. <laughs> and so I'm going to click Edit Layer Properties, and I'm going to call this water. Feature collection, I'm gonna call this land cover, and class of one, or value of one. Click OK. I'm gonna do another one. I'm gonna click new layer. Now it's blue. You know what I, I've just realized? I want um, this water one to be blue, so I'm gonna go back and change the color. Does that make sense? And then I'm going to go in here. This is going to be vegetation. You can change the colors. So this is going to be vegetation. It's going to be a feature collection. It's going to be land cover. It's going to be two. I basically chose, when I started, so they auto-assign a color. They, the tool, auto-assigns you a color. And if you're in the gear, if you're in the configure, you can make it be any color you want. Um, but for water, I'm gonna choose blue. And if you did it like me, where initially water was assigned green and vegetation was assigned blue, you can just switch them. And the way you switch them is to go into the gear and click on the color you want and click okay. Okay, the last um, one. Sorry, gonna, can I? Mm -hmm, actually, yeah. Sorry, quick question. Yeah. Uh, if you um, clicked on something that wasn't the thing you wanted to click on, how do you delete a point? Oh, great question. Oh my gosh, you're over there. I was looking. Okay, sorry about it. Okay, so if you go in here, let's say I didn't like this one actually after all. And so what you need to do is you need to click on it. And do you see how when I click on it, it highlights water? Well, then it should allow you to either click and move it or you can just click delete. So you need to click on the actual point. I'll show you again. If I have one that's, that's here, and then I need to just click on it. Oh, nope, sorry, right now I'm actually um, building another one here. So I need to, let's see, exit my point, then click on it again, and now I can move it and delete it. So if you're in, let me, let me, let me uh, rephrase. If you're in the process of 
actually adding a point or point drawing, you first need to exit and then click on it in order for it to say, okay, now you're in editing mode. Okay. Cool. Okay, I'm going to add one more, and this one's going to be bear. I always run into problems with bear because it always confuses with urban, but I'm going to try anyways. I call this bear feature collection, land cover, and this is three, and this is yellow is a pretty good color. I'm going to say, okay, here's some good bear. These are bay lands, but this is, looks bare. Uh, maybe it's dry veg. Maybe I can even call it dry veg in other times. I probably want to get some bear from this side of the bay. Here's some other areas. That looks like some, some bare areas. Maybe the over here, too. All right. So I have a bunch of training points now. Woohoo! So I, what I want to do... Where am I green? Oh, somehow something happened to my green. Oh, did I not? I didn't, I didn't type in my green. Okay, I got to get some green in here. Uh, let's see. I want to get some forest over here. And I want to get some grassland here. This is, uh, here's some green areas here. Here's some, a park. Okay, that's probably good for now. Maybe I'll get some wetlands. That might confuse it, but we'll face that when we get there. So now I have a bunch of points. Um, I have, you probably want a lot more than this, but this is good for this little, little example. Um, the reason I probably want more in the future is because the world is a diverse and diverse place, a lot of different types of vegetation, different types of bear, different types of water, and you want to make sure if you're trying to capture all of that diversity that your samples reflect it too. Okay, so... The next thing we're going to do is we're going to follow along with our slides and we're going to copy and I'm going to talk to you, uh, talk to you about what's happening as we go. If you run into problems, you can feel free to raise your hand or you can wait and we'll go over it together at the end, okay? So the first step is on slide 30 where I'm going to basically copy this code into at the bottom of my um, uh, code in Earth Engine. And what this is doing is it's merging the three layers, or I should say four layers, urban, vegetation, water, and bear. Let me just, there we go, four, um, into a single feature collection because it's going to use them all. And that's why it was important that our land cover zero, one, two, three, four were all separate. And the class property is going to be uh, land cover. That's why we, we called it that. So I'm going to copy that, go back into my, my thing here. I'm going to scroll all the way down, and I'm going to paste. And then I'm going to click Run. Nothing looks different, and that's because nothing's been shown on the map differently. It's just things are happening in the background. And in fact, if you want, you don't even have to click Run. I'm going to click Return a couple of these here, actually. Stop. So I have some lines. I, have, I want some extra lines here. Um, I may not click Return. Uh, run for each of these, or maybe I will, just in case I run into a bug, I can kind of isolate what happened. Then it wants you to, it wants, I, I want to tell it which bands are going to be used in this classification. Because even though there's all 10 bands in the Landsat 8 image, it doesn't mean that you have to use all of them. And so for now, we're going to be using band 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, which includes, you know, the red, the blue, all the way through middle, uh, near and middle infrared. So I'm going to copy that in, paste it in. Click run. I don't expect anything to happen, but no errors. And the reason I know it's no errors is because your console over here tells you when there's an error. Okay. All right, next slide. I'm going to generate the training data. And what this is basically doing is it's saying, okay, take your feature collection of all the training data and sample these regions. It's basically looking under each of these points what are in those bands? And it's building the training data that's going to be used for, to train the, 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 the map. OK. So it does, it, it's still not doing the magic yet, but it's building the magic. OK? I'm going to click Run. Nothing's happening. That's OK. I don't expect anything to happen. This is just, I just want to make sure there's no errors. OK, don't copy this page, but just to pause here for a second to say, the next step is to actually do the classification. We have our training data built now. Yay. Um, but 
there's lots of different types of classifications. And for those of you who might have done remote sensing in the past, you may have actually learned about some of these, like CART stands for classification and regression tree. It's basically a decision tree that every time there's a split in, in decisions, like which, which way should it go? The point is that's just a type of, of, of classification, an algorithm. There's another one that's often used called random forest, or there's a one that's called naive Bayesian. Um, there's just a lot of different ones, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more, but these are the ones that are like really readily available in Earth Engine right, right this second for me. So I'm going to choose, I'm actually going to choose CART, which is classification and regression tree. So I'm going to go to my next one. Um, this is how I know I just chose CART, but if you want, you can choose a different one and see how it goes. For now, choose CART because it's easy to copy and paste, and then you can start messing with whichever classifier you choose. But for now, I'm going to copy this one. Go down to the bottom, paste it in. I'm going to run. Now, I still don't have a resulting map yet, and I'll tell you why. But over here in my console, I actually see some, some interesting data. And this is a lot of stuff that if you ever publish a paper on the classification you're doing in the class today, you'll want to publish. Because this is what like, other scientists will look and see. Like, how good was the agreement? And where is the separation? Like, it gives you a lot of information. It tells you why a certain pixel was given, why they decided for a certain pixel between urban and bare, for example. So there's lots of great info over here. No time to go into it, but that's the kind of thing that you're glad it spits out for you. OK, slide 35 is I'm actually going to classify the image. And what's very exciting about this is that you start seeing there's an add layer. So we should see something on the map. Because add layer means add it to this map below. So I just, I just pasted the code in. And now I'm waiting. And something's happening. That's good. Well, what I don't like is that my, my colors are all backwards. And I think it's because I mixed up bear and vegetation, which isn't good. And I'm sorry I did that, everyone. But I'll tell you how to fix it. Darn it. I'll be come back to that in a second, though, because right now it's just the colors. That's all that mattered. Right? It's showing the colors wrong for me. Um, but if I go in here now and I, I click classify, or sorry, no, next slide, a confusion matrix. This is the last step. Maybe you want to know why is there confusion? Why is there um, urban in the middle of my lake? Or why is there urban in the middle of my forest when I know there isn't? It's actually bare. There's disagreement between my bare and urban samples. This code will really help. And Nick Clinton wrote this code for me. Um, and it basically, what it basically does, let me go back to the slide actually. What this does is it separates your training data into a training partition and a testing partition to basically see, okay, you're gonna train with this data, but I have an independent sample to then test it. And that's really helpful because if you had like thousands of training data, you could do that. You could have your separate training and separate testing. And so that way you're able to build how accurate, you're able to ask yourself how accurate is your map and get that map accuracy. And if you ever publish this classification in a published paper, they're going to want to know how accurate is your map. And so you're going to need to do these kinds of accuracy assessments. OK. So I copied this and I pasted it in. Boom. I click Run. And now I'm on the right here. I have my, I have my whole classification regression sheet that I had before. And I have my confusion matrix. And what this matrix is telling me is it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matrix, here, right, where it shows the agreement between all of my classes. And what I'm noticing is that class 2 and class uh, 1 have disagreement. And class 2 and class 1 are, let me look in here again, class, that's class 0, water, and vegetation. So it's showing difference. I have one, and I have a feeling that it's this one here that has some confusion. It's having trouble. And sometimes 
That's what the confusion matrix tells us. And sometimes if I'm able to just um, delete this one and find a better one and redo, find a better, more representative point and, and redo it, the confusion matrix will show there's no, no more confusion in your training points. It's a really useful tool if you want to make sure that you don't have confusion. And there we go, it worked. It basically says, okay, all of your points now show um, matching. Uh, the ones that you tested on were also the ones that were validated on, or the ones that were trained on were also the ones that were tested on. So this is basically um, showing how my classification is being trained with very good and separated training classes. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay, so that's actually, that's the end of my classification. Um, and now I want to troubleshoot why it's green for urban versus veg. And I think the reason why is because in the code, it has vegetation or water as two, and it has vegetation as one. And so if I, that's what got me messed up. There we go. Because in, in the code, I basically merge them differently in a different order. Um, and you can find out more about that on this slide here. Oops, sorry if that caused confusion. See where I, I, I first did urban, which was zero, vegetation, which was one, then water, then bear. So it merged them in order. But I had added urban, then water, then vegetation. So, yeah. In this case, it doesn't matter. I could just change the colors, but I wanted to explain it. Hopefully that didn't cause confusion. All right. So that is a classification. That's the first step of one. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's some, some good knowledge there. I'd want to get a lot more training samples, want to get a lot more um, um, diverse training samples from across the Bay Area. But what's really cool is that if I go to the east and I start scrolling, it basically is doing a classification, the same thing on this new area. And that's what's really incredible because now I'm able to scale this classification to anywhere, maybe to the whole globe if you wanted. The problem is though, is that my training data set is only for that little tiny area of California. And if you start going over to, you know, um, the state of Amazonas, or if you go up to Nova Scotia, or if you go anywhere else in the world, you're gonna need training data from that part of the world, right? Because bear looks different. Vegetation looks different. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come back here, try to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. I just want to quickly show you um, the, the finished product, which you guys should have. It's also um, linked to from here. Um, but there's a whole, I just linked to a whole um, documentation on how to do supervised classification. So basically what we just did, there's an additional video here. Um, it's from a couple of years ago, but it's really helpful. Um, and you can go in and you can copy this and you can see how this one was done um, and basically walk through the whole thing. And so this is a supervised classification because we supervised the training points. That's why it's called that. And it's here in the documentation. There's also a whole host of other things you can learn about unsupervised which basically means you give it no training data. It just just group it into things that you think look like look alike. There's also things. There's also um, tutorials around TensorFlow. Um, uh, let's see, um, getting you know doing machine learning, exporting maps, exporting data. This is basically the Google Earth Engine documentation hub where you can go and learn about everything that we learned about today. You can get started on it. Um, and there's tons of videos in here. I encourage you to check it out. Um, just what we do sometimes at our, in our team is, well, what we used to do, we should do it again, Morgan, is setting aside part of Friday to just learn something new that's helpful to your work, like three hours or something, like take a tutorial or take a video, do a tutorial, and then put it away. And then doing that every time, it's like learning a language, right? You get more and more comfortable with it. Um, once, you're, once you're in, um, this documentation, I encourage you to check out guides because that's where all the guides are, like the supervised classification one. Um, I also encourage you to check out um, under reference, you can like see, this is the list of every single thing you could possibly do 
in the code editor. Um, and it's kind of like an encyclopedia or a dictionary. It's a dictionary. So you can find out everything you'd want. If you like the print one, what is, what is the print one all about? And it talks about it, and it gives you code samples. It's really, really helpful. Um, but what's also very helpful is that inside this little window over here, if you click on Docs, there's a lot of things right here where you can see, OK, let me show you a better one. Here's EE Classifier, which we used. Um, if I like this, like here's Smile Cart, which we just used. If I want to bring that in, I can click on it, and I can see right here in the code editor everything that's, that I need. And it even shows some of the um, literature of who, who founded that algorithm. You can learn more about it. Um, and then finally, under Scripts, under Examples, I love this because I always come here and copy and, and use code. Um, you'll see here that there's a lot of different types of um, scripts you can just take and run with. For example, here is an elevation profile. And if I click on that, OK, this is what I said earlier. It asks me, do I want to save my changes? I, I do want to save my changes. And so um, it saved my, where did it save it? Where'd it go? Did I click yes? I got to look that up. OK, well, let's keep going. I'll find it. Um, so the elevation, it might be because I saved it before. Um, elevation profile, it, if I click run, it gives me a whole example of how I can plot an elevation profile in a chart. And so this is showing me all different charts. Here's image time series. Click run. It shows me how to put an image time series right here. If I want to do a buffer, in fact, I'm going to just search for buffer. Buffer. I can click buffer and click run. And it shows me how to do a buffer inside the, 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 the product, inside Google Earth Engine. And if I look here, here, I'm going to search. I'm going to change the buffer radius. I think I need to, I think I need to actually look this up. Buffer. So I basically want to change the first number because that's the distance of my buffer not the max error, which is basically where they don't, where you don't want to go past. So I'm going to make this be 4,000 and click Run. And then now the buffers are much bigger. And so it basically helps you because you can find these different you know, feature descriptions or feature um, code and samples and then know exactly which number to change. OK. So um, we went over some of these examples. You can look at normalized difference or NDVI. There's an there's a example there. You can look at buffer, like I showed you. But all of this stuff is in the developers.google.com slash earth engine. And then the last thing I want to do, um, which I know we didn't get a lot of time to explore these, but I encourage you. These are really good resources. It's after the thank you slide. Please, please, please check these out. They're really fun. For example, um, if you click on um, some of um, these ones here, like, let's see. This is Earth Engine band description. That's not as fun, but it, it's a good example. If you click on this one here, this is, a, this is a great Medium blog article written by Valerie that talks about, let me get rid of that, that talks about exactly what we talked about today, the electromagnetic spectrum um, and different areas of the electromagnetic spectrum that are more useful than others and how they um, kind of Co uh, correlate to different satellites like Sentinel or Landsat, that would be really helpful because sometimes you want to know which satellite I should use. And certain satellites like Landsat 8 versus Sentinel 2, they might be, one might be better than the other for certain things. Um, and then it, she talks about you know, how all of these different um, bands combine into, a, into a, a composite. And so I encourage you guys to read that. It, it's, a good, it's good reading. And then she has these spectral encounters, allows you to like actually start clicking around and seeing the spectra of a, of a pixel that you've clicked on. All right. Cool. I think that's it. Check out these resources. Check out the docs. Um, if you guys are like what you, like, like what you learned here, I recommend the next one is Justin's class, GIS 101. It's, it's assuming Earth Engine knowledge. But if you guys are GIS people, then you might be able to like focus in on the Earth Engine part because you already know all the GIS part, right? 
Um, if this was too much for you and you're like, I want to learn how to do more, more map making before I go into the coding and the remote sensing, then Raleigh's Google Earth class is the next best one or anything else on the agenda. All right? So with that, I'll be here for questions. Feel free to come on up and uh, we're on a break. Thank you so much.